Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 25th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. We are in the, we are discussing the deconstruction of modernity through the lenses of feminism, cultural studies and postmodernism. We have already covered feminism, the feminist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology and also cultural studies ch challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology. In this and today, we are going to discuss the postmodernist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology as a part of deconstruction of modernity. Postmodernist challenge to, to critical modernist paradigm in sociology will be divided into three lectures. In, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss the postmodernist phenomenon, okay? postmodernist aesthetics and, and postmodernity post -modernity as a historical condition. In the, in the second one, in, in the next lecture, we will discuss postmodernism as ontology as well as epistemology okay? and in the third sex, third lecture, we will discuss feminism and postmodernism uh, as a test case. Okay? Uh, we'll start with the postmodernist phenomenon. Postmodernism in fact emerged in the 1980s as a, as a buzzword, as a, as a globalized uh, phenomenon, but then extended backwards to cover developments in literature and literary criticism, philosophy, visual art, architecture and so on since the 1950s especially from the 1970s onward. Okay? It has its own intellectual antecedents, namely French post-structuralist philosophy and its encounter with Anglo-American literary criticism and cultural studies and now governing a set of ideas at least in some contexts. It is, it is, I mean, I mean, it is not a coherent school of thought or body of thought, but a series of ideas combined or separated in differing ways by different authors. Okay? If you look at Derrida, if you look at um, Foucault, if you look at I mean and Lacan and so on, okay, you will find that they also do not have any particular, I mean they, they, they do not have, they do not have any agreement on what constitutes postmodern, postmodern condition, what constitutes postmodernism. Okay? There are three central ideas through which postmodernism is embedded. Okay? One is culture, secondly society and thirdly meta narratives. Okay? We will discuss one by one. What are these three central ideas? Culture as produced and received is postmodern in form and content. I mean postmodernist aesthetics versus modernist aesthetics. Suppose what are, what what what, is, what was modernist aesthetics? I mean, industrial revolution, reasoning capacity, rationality, critique to religion, uh, and so on. Okay. And what is postmodernist aesthetics? We will we'll discuss. Okay. Secondly, society can now be seen as having moved into a postmodern condition. Again, postmodernity versus modernity. Society, especially political economy, for postmodern. And thirdly, for a variety of reasons, the meta narratives which legitimate the knowledge of modern intellectuals can no longer be sustained. I mean, postmodernism versus the Enlightenment project. I mean, all industrial revolution, rationality, critical thinking, reasoning capacity, and so on. Okay. Then, prima facie, if uh, if we have to look at these three three central ideas that culture is pro as produced and received 
is postmodern in form and content. Okay. Society, especially political economy, can now be seen as having moved into a postmodern condition. And the meta narratives which legitimate the knowledge of modern intellectuals can no longer be sustained. Then, what is this post postmodernist aesthetics? I mean, we have discussed modernist aesthetics, okay. postmodernist aesthetics. See, for the sake of this course, this is not very important to discuss postmodernist aesthetics, rather, it is very important to discuss postmodernity as a historical condition. Okay. But to but before dwelling upon postmodernity as a historical condition, it is always better to give some kind of an overview of postmodernist aesthetics. Very quickly, we will cover this this portion that uh, that postmodernist aesthetics. I mean, it is largely irrelevant for our purposes related to argument about modernist aesthetics. Okay, the dominant version is related to a traditionalist view of culture as cultural artifacts, especially literature, but also extended such as to film, television, advertisements and so on, sometimes, but by no means always taken one step further into discussion of reception of these by audience. How do we receive? That? Suppose in a movie, how do we receive it? A movie like Lagan. How do we receive a movie like Three Idiots or PK? Okay. These are very important dimensions. Okay. Lagan is a, is a movie the way suppose I receive it is against colonialism, against power structure, against, um, against all forms of domination, subordination, subjugation and exploitation. Lagan again is a movie which speaks against I mean I speaks against the payment of, of Lagan that that payment that has to be made and also the commodities that that uh, farming communities produce. If you if you look at suppose um, three idiots, this is an alternative way of learning. Learning cannot be done by rote. Rote learning is not the way to learn things. If you really want to learn, okay then you have to express your ideas in novel ways. The entire education system, the entire marking system was interrogated in that movie, Three Idiots. If you, if you look at uh, suppose PK, the entire hitherto existing systems of superstition, uh, religious bigotry, obscurantism, orthodoxy was questioned in, in PK. Okay. That is why these three and of course, many more are there. If you, if you go, go to Do Bigha Jameen by, by or Bimal Roy movie, Balra Sani and others acted, many, many movies made by, produced by Raj Kapoor and so on. Okay. They were beyond their times. And the way the audience tries to receive it. Suppose Lage Rahu Munna Bhai, how the audience receive it? How as a spectator, I am going to receive it. Okay. That is why, the dominant version is related to a traditionalist view of culture. Okay. More, but, but, but it is very important how as part of audience we are going to receive it. When I receive it, okay, reception is very often operational at three levels. One is acceptance, secondly rejection and thirdly ambivalence. I do not know whether what is the projected, portrayed in that movie, in certain movies, I will accept it, I may accept it, I may reject it altogether. Okay. But at times, I do not know whether to accept it or reject it, maintaining the ambivalence. That um, actually, I do not know whether it is good or bad, whether it is right or wrong, I am not able to accept or reject it. I am trying to maintain my ambivalence. Okay. This is how we, we tend to receive a particular movie or, uh, or an advertisement and so on. Okay. Suppose, in, in some, uh, uh, while polishing your sewage, you will find that, that uh, a school going child, okay, he is trying to polish his pair of shoes. Okay. 
and then good police I mean uh, Sue police uh, advertisement. How do you look at it? Somebody may say that yes, uh, uh, that little child uh, is uh, very self-sufficient. He knows how to carry out his job before going to school. But somebody may say that no, it amounts to child labor. How you tend to receive them? That's important. Okay. The way all these all such advertisements about cosmetics and so on, the way they have been gaining momentum in the world of advertisements and so on. I tend to feel that there is absolute racism in such advertisements that uh, black, being black cannot be celebrated. You always tend to be, you should be white to be celebrated. That is absolute racism, okay, on the basis of skin color, okay. That is why how you receive them. More commonly involves the projection of analysis of text onto assumptions about audiences constituted by text rather than as using text for their own purposes. For example, Weberian elective affinity. Against this position, Macrobi, Angela Macrobi in postmodern and popular culture defends a more sociologically informed analysis which broadens our, our notion of cultural production and reception as practices and attempts to recover the everyday meanings such as of clothes shopping. Arguments about production of postmodern culture nevertheless lead us uh, lead into discussion on postmodernity as a, as a historical condition. Okay? And arguments about reception of postmodern culture or the modes of perception revealed or created by it lead into discussion on postmodernism as an attack on modern forms of knowledge and their assumptions and legitimacy. And for from this that, that arguments about production of postmodern culture that lead, which lead us to uh, a discussion on, on postmodernity as a historical condition assumes greater significance in this context. Okay. This is I mean when we say postmodernity as a historical condition, okay. this is effectively one construction placed on a series of observations about contemporary trends okay, which have also been deployed in relation to now discounted theories about post industrialism. I mean you can look at uh, Alvin Toffler, Daniel Bell um, and so on even, even if you can if you want to look at even uh, Marshall McLuhan who coined the term globalization okay, uh, okay. Um, that, that uh, as, as well as in relation to arguments about disorganized capitalism by Lash and Uri and radicalized modernity by Anthony Giddens and so on. Okay. Radicalized modernity or radicalized rationality. Okay. The argument can be presented as a series of contrasts. The argument I mean I mean against the Fordist production methods I mean based on economies of scale that large scale production, assembly line production, Fordist method production. I mean there is a shift from Fordist to post Fordist organization of production with increased flexibility, subcontracting, small batch production and so on with an increasingly important role for knowledge, I mean managerial skills, scientific expertise, information technology and so on. Okay. The argument also can be presented like this that against an economy based on material production for arguably uh, real needs there is a shift to the production of symbols, cultural artifacts and so on. Against the post second world war welfare state compromise there is a shift to a neo conservatism based on the decline of collective bargaining and the weakening of the nation state. Okay. There are seven contrasts that, that we are going to present here. Then you will also find against old social movements of modernity, old social movements which are I mean which were based on class position, economic class position, I mean industrial workers movements and so on. Now there is a formation of new social movements which undermine the holistic claims of the workers movements. I mean new social movements, I mean they include women, environmentalists and so on, even peasantry. Against the, the distinction between high and high culture and low culture, okay, 
I mean against the high culture, low culture, division of modernist culture, there is a general shift to a fragmented and pluralist postmodern cultural configuration. There is a shift from socialization coupled with determination by social relations to individualization and interaction above all with the spectacle. And, and there is also a shift in the social construction of time and space or in their meanings, I mean history, place, community, identity and so on. We have already discussed this, I mean in the context of Giddens, Anthony Giddens, okay? I mean structuration theory, duality of structure, time space distanciation and so on. Okay. Then, then what are these contrasts, these seven contrasts? That one is, I mean there is a shift from Fordist production methods to post Fordist organization of production with increased flexibility subcontracting small batch production with an increasingly important role for knowledge at the I mean managerial skill, scientific expertise, information and communication technologies and so on. One. Secondly, there is a shift to the production of symbols, cultural artifacts and so on, I mean from material production to the production of symbols. Thirdly, there is a shift from the post second world war welfare state compromise to a new conservatism based on the decline of collective bargaining and the weakening of the nation state. And there is a shift from old social movements to new social movements. There is a shift from high culture, low culture divide to a, to a fragmented and pluralist postmodern cultural configuration. There is a shift from socialization plus determination by social relations to individualization and interaction above all with the spectacle. And there is a shift in the social construction of time and space or in their meanings. Meanings are generated through history, time, space, place, community, identity and so on. Okay. I mean we can we can go on and on with these shifts. Okay. What does it imply? What do these contrasts imply? I can I can um, go on and on with such such contrasts. This is this is just one possible list, but it identifies the kind of things that are being pointed to. And this list points to the wider claims being made by arguments about the postmodern condition. Okay? This this I mean postmodern condition, I mean this is very important. And here we'll we, I mean we are going to discuss um, many, many things. I mean uh, Lyotard, um, Lacan, uh, Frederick Jameson and so on, David Harvey and so on. Okay? I mean this this postmodern condition, I mean they can be taken to pull the carpet away from the Marxist analysis of capitalism as a mode of economic organization, from a strategy oriented around the working class as the central agent of social transformation and from a hope of hope for greater substantive rationality through education, socialization, science, increased rational control over of the environment and so on. What is, what is generally missed in this kind of argument that it is a very limited kind of Marxism, very often one belonging to postmodernist authors themselves in an earlier incarnation which is being taken to stand for the whole of Marxism, in particular a 1970s mix of Lenin, Trotsky Althus and Althusser, I mean uh, uh, that is being taken to represent the totality of the meanings and practices of both Marxist authors and of the workers movement. Okay? This, is, this is very important. Okay? Secondly, they can also be taken as uh, relating to a further development within capitalism itself. In which case, the challenge is to reformulate a form of historical materialism which is not contradicted by these developments and dispenses with the local analysis of Marx, Lenin and so on for the sake of retaining the more general elements of the materialist conception of history popularly known as historical materialism. And this is the line taken by two of the central responses to the postmodern challenge. Okay. One is Frederick Jameson okay. and, and uh, we will also discuss Christian Comer's uh, reflections on this. Okay. What Frederick Jameson in postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism and, and, and uh, David Harvey's uh, the condition of postmodernity, these two are, are the central responses to the postmodern challenge. Both of these authors take the line that 
the postmodernists uh, are pointing to something of relevance and Jameson in particular uh, finds the concept of postmodernism a useful one in cultural analysis, but do not accept uh, that these points need to mean a retreat from Marxism. Okay. This is very important and, and then such approach along with the arguments posed by uh, Giddens and Habermas which sees contemporary society in terms of radicalized modernity. Okay. It is a term used by uh, uh, radicalized modernity was used by Giddens and, and such approach has strong empirical support within this kind of argument. For example, the working class is not a homogeneous whole, but something which has periodically been disintegrated by shifts within capitalism since the, ninth, since the 18th century. Okay. And, and which has periodically reconstituted itself. Similarly, the, the welfare state, uh, similarly the welfare state or the new corporatist compromise that can be seen simply as a movement within the longer development of capitalism. Even the apparent shift in emphasis from the production of material goods to the production of knowledge has to be severely qualified. Most of the relevant arguments were made 20 years ago in Krishan Kumar's polemic against theories of post industrial age. Okay? I mean that, that post modernity, post -modernity as, a, as a historical condition okay, uh, must be grounded. Just to make a couple of obvious points here. Okay? One, industrial aging as a technique has been organized around the appropriation of knowledge from the workers and its redeployment of at, uh, redeployment at least since Ford and Teller in the 1920s. This is not restricted to what we think of as industry, but has been exported to become the dominant mode of organization both of agricultural activity uh, and of services. And secondly, it has to be recollected, it has to be remembered that there was an agricultural merchant modernity and an agricultural merchant capitalism prior to the development of industrial production in the secondary sector. Okay. Okay. In, 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 if I have to capture these, these couple of obvious points, okay. if, you, if you look at uh, Alvin Toffler's the third wave, I mean the first wave is, is uh, 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 the first wave is the agricultural society, the second wave is the industrial society uh, and, and the third wave is uh, the information society, which is very often known as the post industrial society, even Manuel Castles and Daniel Bell and so on, they have also reflected on this. Okay. What are the constituents uh, of, of, of um, what are the grounding principles of, of such post industrialism or, or, or the information society? Okay. I mean, um, Standardization, specialization, synchronization, maximization, concentration, and centralization. These are the six grounding principles of the information society or post-industrial society. This is this is very important. Okay. There is a third wave that that Tuffler talked about, or or the coming of post-industrial society, which uh, Daniel Bell reflected on, on, or the network society, which which uh, 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 Castles talked about or, or the wide society as James Martin talked about. Okay. Okay. In other words, the claim that postmodernity is a specific historical condition which displaces modernity has generally been met in particular within sociology by pointing out that what is singled out as modernity is in fact a very limited and specific part of modernity. So, that what is now happening is better understood as another stage in the longer history of modernity. I okay. will be going into this response more closely in the, couple of, in the next couple of I mean, uh, lectures. For the moment, it is enough to point out that most sociologists do not accept the claim that modernity is over, while many would accept that, uh, accept the proposition that postmodernism certainly represents a new cultural configuration linked to a new phase in the development of modernity as a, as a social configuration. This is most commonly presented in a, in a Marxist form, 
but uh, Weberian version of the argument is certainly possible and has been uh, made both by Giddens and, and Brand Turner. That what we talk about postmodernism, modernists argue the proponents of modernity, they argue that no, it, what is postmodernism? It is an extension of modernity, but for the proponents of postmodernism, postmodernism is not an extension of modernity, rather postmodernism is a, is a perspective which has been able to refute or reject modernity in totality. The, the central challenge to the central challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology okay, uh, then is neither the argument about a postmodern aesthetics which many modernists are happy to accept nor the argument about postmodernity as a historical condition which is taken to be misunderstanding of developments that can be adequately accounted for within the terms of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. It relates to the ontological claims of postmodernist philosophy. Okay. What we are going to do in the next lecture that we will discuss postmodernism as ontology, postmodernism also uh, as epistemology. Okay. Because from the very beginning, uh, I mean when we, when we started discussing Wallerstein, Habermas and uh, Giddens, especially Giddens in the context of Giddens, we started with, with the distinction between modernity and postmodernism. If, if modernity is based on certain epistemological foundation, okay, postmodernism rejects any kind of epistemological foundation. Okay. This is very important. Okay. That is why that, that all the, these ontological claims of postmodernist philosophy must be understood against the backdrop of such anti foundational crisis. I mean, this, 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 that, that the way postmodernists go ahead in rejecting any kind of any kind of epistemological foundation. Okay. Then in this lecture, what we have discussed quickly, okay, we started our discussion on deconstruction of modernity through, uh, through the lens of postmodernism, and we have discussed the postmodernist phenomenon, then then how how postmodernist how postmodernism emerged in the mid 1980s as a buzzword but then extended backwards to cover developments in literature and literary criticism, philosophy, visual art, architecture and so on since the 1950s and also especially from the 1970s onward. It has its uh, intellectual antecedents in the French post-structuralist philosophy and its encounter with Anglo-American literary criticism and cultural studies and now governing a set of ideas in at least some contexts. Okay? We have discussed uh, how postmodernism is based on three central ideas, namely culture, society, and meta narratives. Culture, as produced and received, uh, is postmodern in form and content. Society, especially political economy, can now be seen as having moved into a postmodern condition. Okay, and for a variety of reasons. The, the meta narratives which legitimate the knowledge of modern intellectuals can no longer be sustained and so on. Okay? And then we have discussed postmodernist aesthetics, I mean how do people receive literature, uh, film, television, advertisements and so on, because they, I mean, I mean uh, the dominant version is related to a traditionalist view of culture as cultural artifacts, I mean sometimes taken one step further into discussion of reception by of these by by audience okay we have also discussed macrobies postmodernism and popular culture okay i mean how we have we have made some arguments about the production of postmodern culture nevertheless lead into discussion on postmodernity as a historical condition okay arguments about reception of 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 postmodern culture or the modes of perception revealed or created by it lead into discussion on postmodernism as an attack on modern forms of knowledge and their assumptions and legitimacy. Then we have discussed postmodernity as a historical condition, okay. how this is a this is effectively one construction placed on a series of observations about contemporary trends. Uh, which have also been deployed in relation to now discounted theories about post-industrialism, 
as well as in relation to arguments about disorganized capitalism and radicalized modernity. Okay? And we have we have posed, we have made, we have uh, presented this argument as a series of contrasts. Okay? I mean the shift from Fordist production methods to post Fordist organization of production with increased flexibilities of contracting small batch production with an increasingly important role of knowledge and so on. And, and secondly, uh, as a, uh, I mean there is a shift from material production to the production of symbols, uh, cultural artifacts and so on. The, the, there is a shift from, from post second world war welfare state compromise to new conservatism based on the decline of collective bargaining and the weakening of the nascent state. Okay. We have also discussed the shift from old social movements to new social movements. We have also discussed the shift from high culture, low culture divide of modernist culture uh, to a more fragmented and pluralist uh, postmodern cultural configuration. Okay. We have also discussed uh, how there is a shift from socialization coupled to it with determination by social relations to individualization and interaction above all with the spectacle. And this is particularly related to Anthony Giddens that there is a shift in the social construction of time and space or in their meanings, I mean history, place, community and identity and so on. And then we have, we have discussed how they can be taken to pull the carpet away from the Marxist analysis of capitalism as a mode of economic organization from a strategy oriented around the working class as the central agent of social transformation and from a hope for greater substantive rationality through education, socialization, science, increased rational control of the environment and so on. Okay? And then we have discussed how they can be taken as relating to a further development within capitalism itself in which case the challenge is to reformulate uh, a form of um, uh, historical materialism which is not contradicted by these developments and dispenses with the local analysis of Marx, Lenin and so on for the sake of retaining the more general elements of the materialist conception of history. And this is the line taken by two of the central responses to the postmodern challenge namely Frederick Jensen and David Harvey. Both Jensen and Harvey take the line that the postmodernists are pointing to something of relevance, but they do not accept that these points need to uh, mean a retreat from Marxism. Okay? And this approach along with Giddens Habermas argument which sees contemporary society in terms of radicalized modernity has strong empirical support within this kind of argument. I mean we have discussed how working class, what is your working class? It is no longer a homogeneous category. The, the such questions were posed afresh. Okay? And, and then we, we made two quick uh, points that how industrialism as a technique has been organized around the appropriation of knowledge from the workers and its redeployment at least since Ford and Taylor in the 1920s. And this is not restricted to what we think of as industry, but has been exported to become the dominant mode of organization both of agricultural activity and of services. It has to be remembered that there was an agricultural merchant modernity and an agricultural merchant capitalism prior to the development of industrial uh, production in the secondary sector. Okay? And then we have also discussed how the claim that postmodernity is, is a specific historical condition which displaces modernity uh, that has generally been met in particular within sociology by pointing out uh, that what is singled out as, as modernity is in fact a very limited and specific part of modernity. So that what is now happening is better understood as another stage in the longer history of modernity. Okay? In the, in the, that, uh, the, the proposition that postmodernism represents a new cultural configuration linked to a new phase in the development of modernity as a, as a social configuration. Okay? That postmodernity uh, as a historical condition okay, that, that this is most commonly presented in, 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 in the Marxist framework, but a Weberian version of the argument is certainly possible. We have already discussed this and through the works of Anthony Giddens and Brian Turner, 
we can we can we can uh, one can examine post modernity as a historical condition in the next lecture we are going to uh, discuss uh, post modernism as ontology post modernism as epistemology and then we'll discuss feminism and post modernism as a test case okay thank you